Hello guys, welcome to Loving Life Conversation Series. Today we have Fernando, who's the managing partner of BN Trip Ventures. Welcome. Thank you, Faye. Thank you. Happy um, to be here. Yes. So tell me, what has been New York like for you? You're here for the Latin America Association for Private Capital. Yes. I'm here for the LAFCA week, the Latin American Venture Capital Association, their annual meeting. So there's a lot of lots going on right now, and it's also New York Tech Week this week, so excited to be here. Yes. What has been some of the highlights? Well, uh, we got in uh, yesterday morning after an all-night flight wow. and straight into uh, the IDB's um, annual uh, fund managers meeting. So it was great to hear other fund managers from Latin America speak and uh, LPs talking about the future of the region. So it's been very good. Yes. yes. So you invest in B2B tech companies yes. that are doing transformative, solving the largest, biggest issues in Latin America. Right. What do you see are the largest issues or the biggest problems in our okay. time today? Yeah. Well, uh, Latin America is right now, first of all, undergoing very fast digital transformation. It started before COVID, but really definitely sped up through uh, because of COVID. Uh, and so, and at the same time, Latin America has been plagued by several uh, big social and economic problems with economic stagnation and um, poverty and uh, a large unbanked population. Mm -hmm. So some of the trends that we see are mostly, well, the largest is around fintech and providing financial services to unbanked populations and small and med medium businesses um, through technology. So that's where most of the investments are going right now. Uh, but we also saw a rapid transformation around e-commerce and last mile logistics and delivery. Um, and of course, it's, uh, a society with 80 percent internet population uh, internet penetration and most of it through whatsapp so we're seeing mm. a lot of uh, whatsapp first applications being built uh, to provide services uh, for people so some of, some of those, some of those are the things that uh, we see going on in digital transformation right now and i think it's going to continue for for a while Right. So digital transformation, including fintech, e-commerce, last mile logistics, based on WhatsApp. If you could pick like one or two companies that you think are going to be potential unicorn or you're personally really invested in, you think high potential growth, what are those and what do they do? Well, um, we like the logistics space a lot. Um, obviously, it's a huge market. Uh, we've invested in some last mile delivery, not the companies that provide services so much, but uh, the software um, the, to help orchestrate all that. But um, the middle mile and the first mile, you know, are still need to be digitized. So, for example, in our portfolio, we have uh, Nuvo Cargo, which is a digital freight forwarder that provides services for uh, companies that are um, moving cargo uh, by land between Mexico and the United States, for example. Mm. And they've grown tremendously. It's a huge market and it was an industry that was traditionally managed by email and Excel and phone calls. So um, that's one area. But for example, in health, we have another company called uh, Relieve which started out as a digital her, uh, health records company for doctors. Mm. Uh, but now they're becoming uh, a connected marketplace similar to the U.S. where the doctor will prescribe something through the system and the patient can uh, get their lab work um, set up or ask for their prescription through a WhatsApp application or through their, or through their app and get the medicine delivered at home and then also get paid, reimbursed by the uh, insurance company uh, automatically through the application as well. So they're connecting the whole marketplace um, through technology and that's another area that we are very excited about. Wow, so release, Relief is basically you can send a message on WhatsApp 
to request doctors and to get medicine. So delivered. once you, you visit the doctor, yes, you can you can request an appointment to the doctor. But the doctor it starts with the doctor. The software uh, starts. You know, it's a, it's a health record system for electronic health record system for doctors. So the doctor's office is digitized. The doctor prescribes through the system, and then. As the, you know, as the patient, you walk out of the uh, doctor's office and you get a WhatsApp message saying, you, you know, do you want to get your uh, prescription at home? Yes or no? And you can order and pay online. Got it. And receive the medication at your house. Got it. So it's a digital transformation for the whole ecosystem, right. including the doctor, the patients, and the, the insurance the, companies. The insurance company. Right. Wow, that's. Awesome. Like clinics and hospitals as well. Clinics and hospitals. It must be a big undertaking to build this. Yes, yes. Uh, we met um, the two uh, co-founders last year. Uh, they went through our uh, acceleration program and they had already built like the largest uh, electronic health record company in Ecuador and they were growing fast as a B2B SaaS. Uh, but when they went through our acceleration program, so they weren't a completely new company, and they're two doctors. So they know what doctors expected and needed from their software. Mm. So I think that's what's made, made them successful. Uh, but once they went through our program, they pivoted to this larger idea of automating the whole marketplace. So yeah. basically you have an incubator mm -hmm. yourself, and then you are investing into companies. What are some of the criteria you use for getting into the incubator and for investing? Okay, yeah. Um, so some of the more traditional criteria, I would say, first of all, uh, we have to be excited about uh, the market opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a very large um, uh, market already in Latin America. We like companies that use Ecuador sort of as a um, testing ground, as a place to build their prototypes and MVPs, find market, uh, product market fit, and then expand throughout the region. Um, we are a B2B uh, software-focused accelerator. Uh, but most importantly, we're looking for founders that not only have the potential to build and scale uh, venture-backable businesses, but also people that want to give back. Uh, we say that we invest in givers, not takers. Because it's, um, when you're building a new ecosystem from scratch, it's important to have those people that are, uh, once they're successful, they're going to want to give back and help the next generation so that we can all benefit. Yes, I love what you said about giving back. Um, givers, but not takers. And, and you're a firm believer in giving back. I'm curious, where does that come from? Like, I don't walk on the street and meeting investors who say or do giving back as one of the top priorities. Mm -hmm. um, right, well, first of all, I don't see myself as an investor. I see myself as an uh, um, entrepreneur. So I had a 20 year career as a tech entrepreneur. Uh, and entrepreneurs, I think, are always trying to solve problems, always trying to figure out uh, the best solution to the largest problems. And we're also happy to collaborate and, and give back because you know, we all know, we'll know how it is to get started and the importance of having mentors and people that are willing to, um, to assist you in, uh, along the way. So um, professionally, that's always been, that's how we started Buen Trip was, uh, you know, we saw the opportunity that there was a lot of talent in, in Ecuador and, and talent in Latin America, but entrepreneurs weren't connected to the right networks or didn't know how to access capital uh, and really didn't have experience scaling companies. So we felt compelled to give back at that point in our careers and uh, offer, you know, whatever uh, we had learned along the way um, to help these people. But then more personally, I think it also comes from my family, which has a strong tradition of givers, not takers. Uh, my grandmother was an immigrant to, to the United States. Uh, she came to Chicago uh, in the 50s and really helped a lot of Ecuadorian migrants come in and, and settle in and find jobs. And so it's always been part of our, our family, I would say. So your grandma 
yes. uh, came to Chicago in the 50s. How old was she? Uh, it was my grandparents. My, yes. my grandfather came first with my dad. My dad was 12 or 13 at the time. Uh, and, you know, they were looking for uh, opportunities to educate their children, improve their, their lives. And so ultimately the whole family came over. Um, that's on my dad's side. On my mom's side, we're also immigrants, but they came from El Salvador. And my mom was actually born in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, so from both sides of the family, I have a strong tradition of entrepreneurial people trying to you know, improve their lives and give a better future to their kids. It really is. You know, I'm a first generation immigrant myself, so I know how it is like, but America is also a land of opportunity in, in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how did that happen? Did your grandparents from your father's side want to come here and then they made it work or are there opportunities that attract them here in the first place? Uh, no, I mean, the story is that uh, my, my grandfather was in the Ecuadorian army and he got uh, the chance to tour around the United States as part of the uh, Ecuadorian delegation of military officials that came to visit, you know, different military uh, locations in the U.S. Uh, and after he came or before he went back to Ecuador, he met with someone, um, you know, he brought a letter for someone uh, that um, the you know a relative of someone he knew in Ecuador, and <clears throat> asked him, you know, uh, you know, if I if I were to come back, would you be able to help me to get a job? And this was in Chicago, and the guy said yes. And so I think back then it was a lot easier to migrate. So, um, and after that, I think my grandmother really pushed him to take on that opportunity, and uh, he moved to to Chicago. Uh, and contacted him and got a job, uh, right? So that's how it got started. It's a very simple story and I <laughs> loved it. Basically someone said yes and then he did it yes. and your grandma was on board and supportive. So you have a family of serial entrepreneurs, people with entrepreneurial spirit and you founded two company yourself, mm -hmm. right? You, you have two decades. Um, how did the idea of founding your first company, how did that come about and then eventually you sold it? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it really was by chance. Um, you know, I was living back in Ecuador after years after, a couple of years after college, I moved back to Ecuador. Uh, by then I was already very much in love with the internet and I had taught myself how to make, um, build websites. Uh, but I also wanted to have, you know, positive impact in the world. And so I was young and very uh, idealistic. And so I was working for nonprofits, building systems and building websites. Um, and then around that time, I think in 1999, uh, my parents partnered with a couple of other, with another couple. And they, they uh, you know, back then we had very, it was very popular in Ecuador to set up um, internet cafes, cyber cafes. Mm, cyber cafes. Yeah, where people, this uh, connectivity at the home didn't exist, so people would go to these public places like you know, cafes uh, to use the internet. My parents called me one day and they're like, oh, we're, we're partnering with our friends who set up this internet cafe. My mom was going to be involved. And so I went in to help them set up the network, set up the computers. Um, and then I started working, can't remember why, but I was working part time or, or I decided to, you know, go to part time so that I could, uh, could help at the cafe in the afternoons. And once there, I started meeting people, businessmen who were like, oh, do you know how to build websites? I was like, yeah. It's like, you know, would, would you build our company's website? So I started, uh, you know, just <clears throat> building websites for people and started hiring kids out of college to teach them how to build websites so that they can help me with the business. Uh, and that grew until I left uh, the nonprofit where I was working to pursue that full time. 
So you were teaching people to build websites, and then you started hiring college students to help you build websites. Well, people would ask me if I knew how to build websites and would hire me to build their websites. Um, so I started doing that, but soon I started hiring, you know, some of the, the kids that were working at the, the college kids that were working with me at the Internet Cafe were mostly out of computer science and uh, engineering. So I'd hire them to help me with the projects. So it was essentially hiring community for you. They were already working there and they know how to do it. And you have clients and you need people to help you scale. Yes. So they were there to support yes. you. I was never the best programmer and I was never the best graphic designer. I always sucked. So I always surrounded myself with people who had more skills in that area. And uh, you know, I always seen myself more as a vision. Uh, I, I knew how to solve the problems for what the clients needed or wanted. Uh, and it was easier for me to hire uh, young talent to help me build a website. So. It's so satisfying and uplifting for me to hear you said you're never the best, da, 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 because I think a lot of people want to decorate themselves as the best of everything. And one thing I see with you is you really don't have much of an ego. You know, I have to do the best, I have to know it all, whereas you. You think, oh, I want to hire people who are better than me, who can complete my skill sets. How does that come into place, like the no ego? Because I think growing up, it's not easy, right, to, to just let it go. Mm -hmm. Have you always been like that? Well, I'm not sure. I've always been, uh, I mean, I do have my very competitive streak. Uh, but at the same time, I think I know my, my strengths and my limitations. Uh, you know, I've not, uh, I'm not the detailed oriented person. I know that I'm not, you know, yes, I've been trained to stare at a, a spreadsheet for hours and make sure there's no mistakes and things like that, but that had to be trained. Um, so I, you know, much rather uh, think about the big picture, solve the big problems, uh, understand strategy. Uh, and then make sure to surround myself with the experts that I need to complement my, you know, shortcomings. Shortcomings, yeah. I think I'm the same way. Much more high level, abstract, and Omar yeah. is very detailed oriented. <laughs> uh, so you built this company and then you sold it and then you founded another company, ETF.com. Uh, actually, I, I sold Starnetsis to my uh, best client which was uh, back then Index Universe. Uh, so it's a company out of the States, uh, out of New York, that started out as a, as a single magazine, a single publication called the Journal of Indexes, uh, founded by Jim Wyant. And he basically hired me as soon as he uh, set up his company. I had met him before. He had uh, hired me when he was at a different company to build you know, things for him. Uh, and when he left that company and founded his own company, he called me up and, and we started working. So we built the first website for the Journal of Indexes. And that relationship evolved, evolved, evolved. And so you know, he was my number one source of income and I was his number one source of talent. And so we decided to just merge both companies. So. And that's what ultimately became ETF.com. We you know, switched the name from Journal of Indexes to ETF.com. So uh, in 2004, how it started is in 2004, um, a couple of years after I got married, my wife wanted to uh, come to the States for a master's degree. And so I called Jim up as my number one client. I was like, look, Jim, I'm thinking of moving to the States. And he said, well, if you come to uh, New York, we can partner up. And so I told my wife, we're moving to New York. We came to New York. She went to NYU. And Jim and I partnered, and we started providing services to, to the rest of the indexing industry. So we did work for uh, Dow Jones Indexes, Van Eck, and a few other companies uh, you know, in the indexing ETF space. Um, and then that relationship grew and became really complicated, so it made sense to just simplify everything by merging both companies. 
And so he took on all my employees. I became a co-founder at his company, overseeing technology. And, you know, we started growing from there. So basically, it started as a partnership, then mm -hmm. you merged, and you become the CTO and yeah. co-founder. And after that, you sold the two business units to FactSet and Informa. Uh, yes, and then, so a few years after we had merged, uh, one of the other partners, Matt Hogan, had an idea for uh, an ETF analytics platform. We saw that, uh, you know, Morningstar was the number one ratings agency for funds, but you can't really uh, rate ETFs the same way that you re rate um, mutual funds because uh, mutual funds are managed you know, uh, actively by fund managers and ETFs are passive investments that track an index. Uh, and so we thought we were in the best position to build an ETF analytics platform because we understood ETFs better than anyone else um, we raised money uh, and grew a big team of analysts to start analyzing all the U.S. listed ETFs. Um, and we did that for, it took us a while, but we finally went to market and then we had that for like five years. Um, it was, it was kind of hard to really find how to sell that because mm. our relationship was with the financial advisor, uh, so more retail oriented but we had built a very uh, institutional quality product and we had a hard time um, reaching the institutions. You know, there's very long sales cycles and uh, very competitive. So uh, Faxit came and they were thinking of, of building a competitive product, uh, but they knew it was gonna take them two or three years. So instead they decided to buy our product and they took ETF analytics along with the team that was running it and uh, our investors then sort of said okay uh, it's time to you know return the capital and so we sold the rest of the business so the other two parts of the business were uh, the events business we had the largest uh, ETF related event in the world, I would say, um, inside ETFs, aimed at financial advisors every year. And so we sold that to Informa, which is a company in, out of uh, London. And, uh, and then, the, you know, the remaining, which is sort of the core business, the, the website and the publications, uh, we sold initially to BATS, which was uh, an independent exchange, mm. um, equities exchange. Um, that went public right after they bought us, and then immediately after that, the Chicago Board Options Exchange bought them. So I ended up working for SIBO for three years. Did you uh, enjoy that? Yes, yes, very much. Uh, very grateful with the team uh, at SIBO, especially the software development team in Kansas City, or I, you know, I learned a lot from them. Uh, but after three years, it was obvious that it was time for a change, you know, as an entrepreneur, I was, you know, itching to get yes. back and, and do something uh, new. Yeah. The founder's bug is <laughs> yeah. yelling inside you. Yes, exactly. So you had two, uh, three different business units. One you sold to Faxes, mm -hmm. and the second events you sold to Informa, mm -hmm. and then the third eventually become part of Siebel. How did that selling business process work? Do people come to you or do you have to look for people? How was the negotiation? What are some of the things you learned? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, at first we were running out of money and we're having to go back out and raise more money, uh, which is not a pleasurable thing to do when, you know, it's because you're running out of money. Uh, and so one of our investors told Jim, my, my partner, they saying, I, I know people at Faxit, Faxit are looking for this, and so why don't you talk to them? So that's, that one, that's how that happened. For the second one, um, we decided to use uh, an investment banker mm. um, to make sure we, had, we got the best outcome. And I think that was, um, it was a smart move because they decided they looked at our financials and even though 
it, it was counterintuitive, but they said it actually makes more sense if you split up the business now, the remainder of the business in two, and sell the events separately from the publications uh, to unlock more value, and that's essentially what happened. And then once we sold that to Informa, the second transaction we just handled in-house because we had learned what the investment bankers were doing and basically, you know, uh, get a list of potential buyers, email them, you know, ask them if they want to sell, uh, sign an NDA, uh, and then take the transaction from there. Luckily, I didn't have to handle that. You know, our, our COO, who then became the CEO after the informal transaction, uh, was um, really good at that and, you know, very proficient. So he took care of that. I just had to show up to the due diligence meetings and, you know, look smart in front of the potential buyers. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to show up and talk and uh, yeah, that's and it. Yeah, screw up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any lessons you learned from negotiation, if there were any? Um, well, uh, along the way you learn, uh, you know, things, with, uh, mostly through mistakes. Uh, but I'm not one to really dwell on the past or any mistakes like that. I just try to learn my lessons and, and make sure I don't uh, make the same mistake uh, later. Um, you never know, sort of, you, you know, I think one tends to assume that uh, the person in front of you has the same worldview as you or uh, the same ethics as you. And so, uh, you know, you have to be cognizant that it's not always the case and that there's conflicts of interest and that you have to, you know, look out for your best interests. Uh, but try to fair, right, uh, try to find a fair negotiation, fair, fair price for everyone. Yeah. yeah. I totally agree. People's view are shaped by their experience mm -hmm. and sometimes persuading someone doesn't really work because they have a completely different life experience than you. So you exited your entrepreneurship and then you become a founder again because as um, a VC investor, mm -hmm. how, how was that putting it together? You're in your second fund now or you're raising your second fund? Right, yeah. So like I said, uh, in, in 2014, when I was still at ETF.com, uh, and I was back in Ecuador, we got together with a few friends, and we saw that there was a lot of excitement in the air about entrepreneurship and innovation and startups, uh, but a lot of programs that were being uh, sort of pushed and pursued, the agenda was being pursued by the government or by academia, or in general by people who had never built a company. And we saw the talent there. We saw there was a lot of uh, good founders, uh, good programmers, uh, but nobody in the ecosystem that really knew what they were talking about um, helping. So, you know, like I said, it was, it was a way of giving back. So at first it started as a side project, sort of as a hobby. Um, you know, we set up a space, physical space, where entrepreneurs could gather. We started organizing um, startup weekends and three-day startup and all these programs, you know, for people to come in and ideate and come up, you know, hackathons, that kind of thing. And events where people could come and pitch and drink beer and socialize and network. Um, and then I started mentoring, uh, well, you know, to the partners, we started mentoring the founders that were coming through. So this was our passion. This was our like, you know, after, after work, close my computer, go to the co-working space, hang out. Um, and then <clears throat> something funny happened. We saw, I sold the company, you know, we had, a, a, you know, some liquidity, uh, same with my partner. He had some, um, you know, family, uh, family business. He was setting up his family office. Uh, so he had some liquidity and we were like, well, these guys are really talented. You know, after three months of mentoring them, it's like, we want to write their first check. So we started being the most active angel investors in Ecuador. 
And we first tried to gather other angel investors, but nobody was really following our lead and nobody had that sort of like American mentality of, you know, yeah, you're ready. Here's your first 50 or a hundred thousand dollars, you know, go to work. Uh, it was just us. So it came to a point where I, you know, looking at my career, looking at where I was, um, I decided it was time to leave SIBO, leave ETF.com and, um, you know, go out and, and do this professionally. So I left and then started figuring out how to build a, a venture capital firm from scratch. And so that was in 20, mid 2019 that I left ETF.com. And last year we uh, managed to raise our first prototype fund. You know, you get a short traction. Nobody believes you just because of your previous track record. You have to, uh, or you know, you've been a good angel investor you, you need to show that you can raise money, that you can invest. So we raised our first fund and luckily for us, we already had several years of Buen Trip Hub, the platform. So we were, you know, had proprietary deal flow that nobody else was seeing, uh, working with the best, most talented founders from a very early stage, a reputation inside of Ecuador. And so then, uh, you know, we started raising money from people who were sort of following our trajectory and were excited about what we were doing, uh, mostly angels and a couple of family offices. Um, and, you know, set up the fund, started investing through that, and then we took our mentorship program, which was really, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and turned that into our acceleration program. And so, yeah, that's how Fund One got raised and deployed. And now we're raising fun too. I love the journey of you. Everything you do is starting small and then you get traction and you make it more official. It was like, I want to start with this grand idea of launching a VC fund and then like figure out backwards. It's almost like you started doing and then that got bigger mm -hmm. and then it becomes a natural transition to your next step. Right. I think that's the, 20 years of software development has really taught me that, uh, of being agile and starting small and sort of validating the problem through like a, you know, a total, like a complete cycle, even if it's really small. But once you build, it's sort of building an onion from the inside out, you know, by layers. So first you build a, the kernel and then you keep adding on to it. It's, it's, uh, it's how you build software and that's how I view the world. So. Building from the onion from inside out. Yeah. It's like rolling um, a snowball, yes. like bigger and bigger. So you're in the process of raising for your second fund. Mm -hmm. What's your vision for the second fund? How would that differ or the same compared with the first one? Yeah. So the first one was very centered around the idea that Ecuador is a great place to launch a company. Uh, validated and and then expanded from there. It's somewhat of a contrarian view in general because Ecuador is usually skipped by the large capital pools, private equity, venture capitals. They, they, you know, they're like, oh yeah, we invest in in South America or we invest in the Indian region. What's in the Indian region? Colombia, Peru, Chile, right? Ecuador, they always skip Ecuador. Um, but it's also not a very contrarian view because other companies, large companies have done it. Waze famously uh, landed in Latin America in Ecuador first, uh, launched the product there, figured out how to grow Waze in a country like Ecuador. And then 18 months later, they were throughout Latin America and had millions of downloads. Um, and in the consumer, uh, consumer product space, uh, companies like Nestle and Kraft do the same thing. And today, companies like Uber do the same thing. They test in Ecuador, and if it works, then they expand it throughout South America. The second fund has a broader vision. Um, we're still investing in B2B software companies. 
Uh, we still want to be number one in Ecuador. But, uh, you know, our, our reputation has grown. Our, our events are now, uh, all our events went online. And so we're reaching a much broader audience. And I think it's not just Ecuador that can be a good testing ground when you're building uh, software. I think there's a lot of talent in small countries that are underappreciated, like Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, or even Colombia or Central America, where traditional investors don't like to go because they consider them small markets. But I think small markets are a great place to start out, figure out what you're building, and then scaling a software company is not as difficult as uh, scaling a traditional company. So we want to become really good at helping companies uh, scale throughout the region, no matter where they were started. So fund one was using Ecuador as a launch pad, as a mm -hmm. testing ground. But fund two is more countries similar to Ecuador, like almost like the emerging market inside Latin. Yes. So here's a question. You got proprietary deal flow in Ecuador. And now for fund two, when you're expanding, how are you getting deal flow in those regions similar mm -hmm. to Ecuador? Yeah. So no, it was great. Uh, we, for fund one, we managed to do uh, two rounds of our acceleration program. And the first one, we just marketed and just do, did it all 100% in Ecuador. And we invested in seven companies. Um, in this year, earlier this year, we did our second acceleration program where we decided to focus it much more narrowly on B2B software companies that are sort of building sort of like the infrastructure and services layer uh, that the, that the uh, region needs. Um, and we marketed more broadly and we were very surprised and happy to get applicants from the US, Mexico, Central America, Colombia, throughout South America, even including Argentina. Uh, and so we were really able to pick the best from you know, the whole continent. Uh, and, and we were lucky to be able to invest into um, you know, four companies, one from the US, one from Mexico, and two from Ecuador um, that went through the acceleration program. So we, we uh, want to continue doing that. And the, you know, people are coming to us. I think we're gaining a reputation because of our founder-friendly focus, having been uh, uh, operators and, and founders ourselves. Uh, people really appreciate it in the region where most venture capitalists tend to be, you know, finance guys, private equity guys that want to, you know, come in early. Vouchers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sharks, though. Yes. <laughs> well, there's really good companies in, in, out there, a lot of good firms, but very few firms that are run by ex-operators. So I think that differentiates us. And so we're starting to get um, recommendations, you know, people through from our own portfolio, recommend others. And so that's how, you know, we'll continue to bank on that on the strength of our reputation to attract more, more talent from the region. Yes, even the building reputation is like the analogy, building the audience from, from the core, right? Your reputation ripple throughout Ecuador and mm -hmm. then to more countries in the time. If everything goes right in 10 years, where do you see yourself, mm -hmm. Boeing Trip Ventures, your mission, your life? What does that look like? Uh, well, if everything goes well in 10 years, we'll probably start you know, thinking about uh, closing our third fund and, and uh, launching our fourth fund. Um, I don't think the size of the fund is going to vary that much. We want to continue being um, just concentrated on, uh, you know, the earliest stages. And so I don't think, uh, you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred million dollar fund is conducive for that because people don't need a $5 million check to go build a prototype. Um, so we want to continue, you know, find the right size, maybe 20, $30 million funds. Uh, I'd like to span beyond uh, B2B software. I think that's an area where 
we feel very comfortable because that's where I have the most experience. Uh, but really want to build a platform, not just for founders, but also for other investors. So I want to build a platform where other um, operators and ex-founders who want to go into uh, venture capital can make use of our platform to you know, tap into that um, uh, the deal f flow and access to capital and build you know, alongside with us. So we want to um, bring in other GPs that have other expertise and, and other you know, geographic um, uh, footprints yeah, and build a firm that way. So it's another way for you to give back, right? The reason why you started Venture is mentoring entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And now you become a VC yourself. In 10 years time, you want to use that knowledge to help more people who are in your shoes to get into the venture capital space. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yes, you <laughs> <you're right. laughs> Wow. I want, to, uh, I want to end with more like personal and family. Mm -hmm. So you have two kids, mm -hmm. right? How old are they? Uh, 13 and 10. 13 and 10. Yes. How are you, how would you rate yourself as a father or as a husband compared with you as entrepreneur and investor? How much time, energy are you able to spend with them? Uh, I, don't, I don't want to put myself at a radio. I think you would have to ask my wife and my kids about that. Uh, no, but I mean, for me, I, I don't like to be, I don't like to do things half-ass. I, I don't like to be mediocre. So I know that building a firm uh, is, you know, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. But I'm also aware that there's a lot of people who are just obsessive with work and then uh, work becomes an excuse to forget about other parts of your life that are important. And I see that especially in the U.S. there's like this sort of um, putting obsessiveness with work in a pedestal and even if it comes at the cost of other things in your life. And I don't, um, I don't agree with that. Uh, there was a moment in my life where I faced um, you know, a very big health challenge and it really helped me put things in perspective. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm doing, you know, like you said, because of the impact it brings, you know, paying it forward. Uh, but I don't think I would be uh, very honest with myself if I let my family or my kids slip and if I wasn't there for my kids, because that's where I really want to have the most impact, right? It's, it's, the future generation, but starting with my own kids, not, not just you know, the rest. So, yeah, I try to find work-life balance. Um, I try to, when I'm with a family, just concentrate on the family. When I'm work, concentrate on work. And it's not always easy, but if you don't, you know, uh, put both at the same importance, then you're never going to even... Uh, even try to do it. So, you know, at least you have to be aware and, and, and try to find that balance. Find that balance. Yeah. And it's easier said than done. Easier said than done, but it's also not that hard when you have, you know, a great family, great kids, they're fun and you don't want to, you know, waste these th years and then regret. I, I try not, not to have any regrets in my life and uh, not just by pushing down things that, <laughs> that I don't like, but also by actually, you know, working on things that I don't want to regret later. So you, you got to put in the time. Yes, yeah. because for kids growing up, it's like a live streaming. Once you miss the year there too, it's gone. And once you miss the year there 12 and 13, you never come right. back. Right. Yes. And they don't care if you're a hotshot VC or whatever, you're just that to them. And, you know, you're just, your husband to your wife, so you gotta be there. Yeah. You gotta be there. Yeah. Yes. You can't let work uh, define your identity. 
Yeah, yeah. Yes. I feel you alluded to this question, which I always like, like to ask, which is how do you measure the success of your life? Well, uh, it's funny, you know, it's, um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I started philosophy, politics, and economics in yes. college. I've always, uh, since high school, been intrigued with success in life and what is life. And, you know, a couple of books that I read in high school really, uh, I think, marked my philosophy of life. So, uh, one is, uh, as I started off, was not following the well-trodden path. But there's no, there's no path set up for you when, you know, you, you make your own path. And so, being independent and building something new and doing my own thing has always been important to me. Uh, and then, like I said, back in 2018, 2017, you know, after I had my health scare, uh, I looked back on my life, reflected, and it's like, okay, I've, I've had some impact in, you know, in Ecuador and the people, the, the families of the people that I employed. Uh, but I, I started thinking about my legacy and what the next 20 years were going to be like and what I was going to leave behind. So, um, so I think success is, you know, when you get to your deathbed and you're happy with what you've done and you, and you feel like you've lived a complete life, I think that is <clears throat> the definition of success. You feel you have lived a complete life. Yes. Thank you so much, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank I babe. wish we could have a guest. Oh, thank you. All right. That's it. Yay. Thank you. Thanks. Oh my God, the, the mosquitoes the are killing me. Yeah. It's worse oh than my God.